were at Pro Player Stadium in Florida. It's just after midnight on October 27th, 1997. It's the bottom of the 11th inning of Game 7 of the World Series between one of the American League's original franchises and one of the National League's newest. The score is tied 2-2, there are two outs, and the bases are loaded. Edgar Renteria would absolutely love to get a hit here. Charles Nagy does not want that. And while the World Series could come down to this at-bat between these two athletes, there are a whole lot of other at-bats and athletes and managers and owners that got us to this point. So let's rewind. Just one out, and Cleveland survives to try and capture their first title since 1948. Now, they have been a contender more recently than that. 1995, they won a league-best 100 games, they took the pennant, and even won two games in the World Series, which isn't enough games. Disappointing, but another year, another chance, another league-best record. Only that time, they didn't even get out of the ALDS. Pretty big bummer. So, they made some roster moves. They let all-star silver slugger, three-time RBI leader Albert Bell go in free agency. He had a history of being a distraction. They'd miss Bell's contributions, but they still had a more than stacked lineup. Kenny Lofton was the best leadoff hitter at the time, and everybody loved him. But then he was traded. Fans weren't pleased. In return, Atlanta sent Marquise Grissom and David Justice to Ohio. Justice was cool, but Grissom struggled early. He didn't win over any fans, or management for that matter. By mid-season, he was dropped from the leadoff position. Actually, not a lot was going right for the franchise by mid-season, and manager Mike Hargrove was updating his resume. But the old white and red and navy got things together by the end of the season and won 16 games in September. And while an 86 and 75 record is their worst in four years, it was enough to get them to the postseason, where they dispatched the 96-win reigning champion Yankees. Then they got a little revenge on Baltimore, beating them in six games to take the pennant. Grissom actually played a big role in the ALCS victory. And here they are, back in the World Series for the second time in three years. They face the Marlins, who also added some new faces this season. Although all their players are kinda new, the team's only been around five years. The Marlins were an expansion team in 1993, which makes them the fastest club to get to the Fall Classic ever. But they've never had a winning season until this year. So how'd they do it? One word, love. Just kidding, money, the one word is money. They spent so much money. First, billionaire owner Wayne Huizenga lured Jim Leland from Pittsburgh. After 11 years with the Pirates, Leland had never been to the World Series, yet he was still regarded as one of the best managers in baseball. Some even believed he was smarter than a brain pie, but I'm reserving judgment till I've tasted one. Next, Huizenga spent $89 million on six free agents. The biggest spends were for star pitcher Alex Fernandez and big hitter Moises Alou and Bobby Bonilla. Then the owner gave Gary Sheffield a 61 million six-year extension. And what do you know? It worked. While not all the big contracts yielded results, enough of them did. Fernandez was dominant, and Bonilla and Alou delivered on offense, and the Fish finished the 97 season with their first winning record. But spending multi-millions on your team adds some pressure, and Heisinger said he wanted to sell. Maybe a strong postseason run would change his mind? As the wildcard team, the Marlins faced off against the Giants in the division series. They won game one on the last at bat. They won game two on the last at bat. Enough with the drama, Alex Fernandez gave him some breathing room in game three. And that was a sweep of the NLDS. Up against Atlanta for the pennant, Florida got the first game, but then they were crushed in game two because Fernandez lasted just two and two thirds innings. It was later revealed he had a torn rotator cuff. The Marlins suffered more misfortunes in the NLCS, though none were quite so devastating. Alou jammed his wrist and couldn't start in Game 2 or 3. Kevin Brown, who hadn't lost since July, got sick and couldn't play in Game 4. He wasn't better in time for Game 5 either, but that kinda worked out. Rookie LeVon Hernandez filled in and threw an NLCS record of 15 strikeouts. Some people thought the strike zone was way too big, but hey, I'm not trying to bring Hernandez down. The Cuban defector had had a rough go of it since he came to America in 96. His family was back in Cuba, he didn't really know English, and he consoled himself by overeating. A year later, he's in better shape and setting records. Good for him. 
In Elimination Game 6, Kevin Brown was finally healthy and got the win. With Atlanta defeated, the Marlins became the first wildcard team to make it to the World Series. But not everyone was happy for them. Apparently, rich guy buys success wasn't the most endearing storyline. And now that we're complaining, people weren't thrilled Cleveland was in the World Series either. They only won 86 games, what are they doing here? General consensus was this was going to be a boring World Series full of not great baseball. But uh, it doesn't really get more exciting than extra innings in do or die game 7. Though there was some bad baseball in this series. Just ask Charles Nagy. And wait, why is Nagy pitching right now? He's not a closer. And actually, Nagy wasn't supposed to play at all tonight. Nagy started Game 3 and was slated to pitch again in Game 7 schedule-wise, but Game 3 went so poorly the team lost confidence in him. And Hargrove thought Nagy lost confidence in himself, so the pitcher would sit Game 7. Now, Game 3 was not a defensive showcase. Mike Hargrove referred to the 4-hour and 12-minute game as just about the ugliest game you'll ever see. Oh, the Marlins won, so maybe that influenced Hargrove's opinion. Game 4 went a lot better for Cleveland. Jarrett Wright, a rookie three years out of high school, pitched like a hardened veteran. And that's who Hargrove decided should start Game 7, despite just three days rest. He'd last as long as he could. For six innings, Wright held Florida to one hit and no runs. But after he gave up a homer to Bonilla in the seventh, Hargrove took him out and started running through the bullpen. In the bottom of the ninth, with Cleveland leading 2-1, he went to his closer, Jose Mesa. Mesa was unbelievable in their 95 run. But this year, his numbers were down. He struggled early, but earned his way back to the closer spot and returned to form. And tonight, he needed just one more save to win a championship. Perfectly doable. Likely, even. So likely that the commissioner's trophy was wheeled into Cleveland's locker room. Plastic went up over the lockers to protect them from the celebratory champagne that was sure to rain down in just a few... Oh, well, wait a sec. Alou opened with a broken bat single. Uh-oh. Then, with runners on the corners, Craig Council hit a sack fly, and Alou scored. Tie game. After Mesa gave up two singles in the 10th, Hargrove finally took him out, and he only had one pitcher left to put in, Charles Nagy. So here we are, Nagy's looking for redemption. But he's not the only one. Over here, covering second base with the weight of the world on his shoulders, is Tony Fernandez. In the Dominican Republic at 11 years old, Tony Fernandez was so good he attracted scouts, despite playing with a makeshift mitt and a knee issue that needed surgery. One scout even wanted Fernandez to come live with him to prepare for MLB, but Fernandez was like, I'm 11? When the scout offered to pay for his knee surgery a few years later, Fernandez made the move. And in 1979, when Fernandez was 16, the scout signed him to the Blue Jays and told no one about the surgery. Lies of omission barely count as lies, especially when everything works out. Fernandez was called up to the majors in 83, and three years later, he recorded the most single season hits by a shortstop since 1941. His fielding might have been even better. He won four gold gloves and became known for his signature sidearm flip. He bounced around the majors a bit in the early 90s, but in 93, he was back in Toronto helping the Blue Jays to a title. This year, at age 35, coming off an injury, he signed with Cleveland in a reduced role, at second rather than shortstop. But he made the most of it. In fact, he was the hero of the ALCS. In Game 6, Fernandez was a late replacement for Bip Roberts, who was injured during batting practice. And good thing he was, sorry Bip, because in the 11th, Fernandez homered for the 1-0 win, giving his team the ALCS. But Hargrove still preferred to play Roberts over Fernandez in the World Series. Fernandez is a better fielder, but Roberts is the better batter. Fernandez is only playing tonight because Bip got the flu. And once again, it's kind of a good thing. Once again, sorry, Bip. In the third, Fernandez hit a two-out, two-run single, giving his team its only appearance on the scoreboard tonight. And in the 11th, Craig Council hit a textbook double play right to the four-time gold glove winner. Ooh. Fernandez. of the past won't take the sting of this one away. Devastating. Instead, the inning continued. Nagy intentionally walked Jim Eisenreich and the bases were loaded. Brazilian Fernandez kept his cool after his fudge up and got the force out at home, but the bases are still loaded. 
Tony Fernandez lost a chance to be the hero of the World Series, and now that title is someone else's for the taking. Edgar Renteria is at the plate. Renteria grew up on the coast of Colombia, helping his mother sell fish and fruit to support his family. Like Fernandez, he used a makeshift glove as a kid. The Colombian coast is the only part of the country that plays baseball. It's a soccer country. In fact, Renteria himself planned to be a professional soccer player, but he had more luck with baseball. When he was 16, he signed with the Marlins, and in 96, at age 19, he was called up to the majors. Not necessarily because he was ready, but because Kurt Abbott got hurt. Renteria was instantly a great defender. When Abbott got healthy, he was moved to third base so Renteria could stay at shortstop. And Edgar wasn't too shabby on offense either. He was runner-up for the National League Rookie of the Year. Some thought he only came in second because the Marlins weren't in the playoffs and thus he had less TV exposure. This year, he's been a big part of the Marlins' success. He's not one of the hired guns, but he batted before them, so he got a lot of pitches and he hit a lot of those pitches. He has an ability to adjust during an at-bat and isn't afraid to go the other way. Oh, and one more relevant detail, he has ice in his veins. Renteria has recorded seven game-winning hits this year, five of which were in the bottom of the ninth or during extra innings, and one of those was a two-out walk-off single in the bottom of the ninth in the NLDS opener against the Giants. At least one paper has dubbed Renteria Mr. Late Inning. But other than the winning hit in the opener, Renteria wasn't hitting that well in the NLDS. He was better in the next round, and how's he been tonight? Well, he made a pretty heads-up play in the ninth, with runners on the corners, Renteria fielded the ball, but instead of going for the double play, he threw Sandy Alomar out at home. Had Alomar scored, well, let's just say nobody would have had to take the champagne out of the visiting locker room. But come on, quit burying the lead. What about his hitting tonight? That's all anybody cares about right now. He had a double in the first and a single in the tenth, but neither had mounted to runs. And on this potential game winning at bat, the very clutch hitter actually looks out of sorts. Renteria thought it was going to hit him. That's how good that pitch was. And here we are. One of the oldest franchises needs an out to survive. One of the newest needs a run to become the fastest team to a title ever. In the dugout, Jose Mesa hopes his team can make everyone forget his blown save. On the mound, Charles Nagy wants redemption for a game so ugly he got benched. On second, Tony Fernandez needs redemption for a mistake that's beneath him. And at the plate is Mr. Late Inning. Welcome to A Moment in History. The 0-1 pitch. Yeah. A liner off Nagy's glove into center field. The Florida Marlins have won the World Series. Thanks for watching, everybody. Hope you had a good time. Remember to subscribe. That way you don't have to type as much stuff into the YouTube search bar. Who has time for that? There are videos to watch, like these. For Secret Base, I'm Clara Morris. Good night and good game.